So sometimes I get questions about who will be a good introduction to certain things, and this is some personal opinions I think of some good people to follow for a variety of subjects. First of all, if you want to learn about the medical things, biology, about the brain, I really recommend these people. The first guy I want to talk about is Stephen J. Gould. He mostly wrote books. He appears on a couple of um, podcasts. Passed away, I think, early to early late two thousand tens. Um, but he really dispelled. He was a natural historian, evolutionary biologist. Really dispelled a lot of myths about evolution. Dispelled eugenetics. His book *Miss Mister Man* is is trying to pr- start something. Let's say eugenics, right? And this shows the awful history, how they made up bogus data and everything, about from a really scientific perspective. But he talks about how natural selection is not a dominant force in evolution. One of the most well-respected evolutionary theorists and natural historians. He also goes into, talks about Darwin. He talks about famous scientists, uh, Mendeleev, Da Vinci, in history and cool little facts and exceptions to rules like sponges that are carnivorous, flies that eat frogs. Really cool dude and writes very excellent small stories and big stories, even though I would not start on his book, Evolutionary Theory, because that's his last book he wrote where he just put all of his ideas down. But a lot of his small books are excellent. I cannot highly recommend he's Jewish, and uh, double cancer survival, but the last time he got cancer, it um, killed him, and they said he wouldn't survive. The next one to talk about that I feel like is really great is Midlife Crisis. Well, Stephen Jay Gould is very evolutionary in biology and they won't tell you that much health for you about yourself. Midlife crisis is all about um, health stuff, but it's also cool history facts about the evolution of medicine and hospitals. But it goes a lot around to dispel like bad science and critique the scientific industry with peer review or how it's not high enough standards or how bad publishing practice and how the peer review journals really play on people to extract money out of them. But he also talks about the messed up history. Uh, for Black History Month, he was one of the few medical YouTubers that really talked about black people that led to leaps and bounds in medical fields, cardiologists, and how they're not recognized. And he's gone out of his way to like promote, talk about how there's racism in medicine. He himself is an Indian. Um, man, and a lot of other medical YouTubers even deny that there's racism in medicine, and he's up front there's bias in medicine. He's a cardiologist by training and is a practicing cardiologist. He's also super, super funny with a dark sense of humor that I really like. So cannot highly recommend him enough, and he need have no background to start his channel, and it's not that bloody and gore. There's always blood and gore in medicine, but he doesn't sell it. All over Sachs, he, he appears in a couple of great, um, how would I say it, great radio um, podcasts, but that's not his thing. He just is a guest, but he is an amazing person. He is one of the few um, non-autistic, non-ADHD people that really advocate for their rights. He had a rights for a bunch of different neurodivergents. He himself had complete face blindness, so he could recognize no one's face, even his own mother's and Mosin's. He worked in psychiatry, psychology, neurology, both in practice and in quantling. He has also did some anthropology work, and, but his approach is one of the most human, humanitarian, hum, treating people like they're actually human beings approach. Talking about the good and the bad from their perspective, he loved, talked a lot. He had a lot of stuff to do with pace and consent, how he soon looked down upon people, how he should try to make everyone's life happy, how he soon force people. Great guy. He also was right into um, octopuses and cephalopods in general and funded a lot of stuff there, marine biology conservation. He was for gay rights activist and he was gay himself, um, beyond just for disability. Um, Probably part of the thing, reason why he was much more progressive than his counterparts was because he grew up near con- gay conversion therapist, and so he really had took psychology, the 
a person of that and being faced by probably taught him to be more compassionate, in my opinion. Really cool dude. He also broke a couple world records that for um, weight training and for riding motorcycles in his young years. They were since broken by other people, but really impressive still. So amazing and very articulate on podcasts. So um, NPR Science Friday, it's a weekly podcast. It goes up and down, but oftentimes excellent roundup of just science news and you can be a complete beginner and understand it and they cover everything. It's just a general podcast all over the place. Sometimes they have great interviews, sometimes not so much. Sometimes it's great little summaries. The New York, then next one I want to cover is um, the New York Times. The New York Times, CNN is the one, New York Times gives you some of the most in-depth, most accurate articles of a mainstream newspaper that's in science focus. CNN, ABC News tend to cut off the articles that's not really in depth. They don't really give you sense, the same perspective, it's like comparing to different technology ideas as New York Times. New York Times tends to post more like really good science, like Axel, like, like CNN just like publishes like, oh, a new cancer drug. New York Times has a lot more quality control. Like if they publish a new idea, it probably is a lot more likely to be a good new idea, not just a random new idea. Well, CNN and ABC will just publish anything that sounds good to them at all, even though technically to correct, sometimes it's misleading. Uh, so uh, like New York Times are really more likely to trust when they say it's a breakthrough. And just a lot more perspective, a lot more details, and they cite the sources better, give more credit. I like the explanation style better. Just all, all over the place, a better one. Another one is Medium. So Medium doesn't have as much Medium. There's Medium Daily, which you can sign up for free. There's ways you can make free accounts to get even more articles, and you can dupe the system. Oh, yeah. So far, New York Times is the only one. NPR Science Friday is completely free online. New York Times, you have to pay for, but you can get free, sometimes free school and a couple free articles every week. But I would support them because they're actually worthwhile. Medium. Then there's Medium you have to pay for, which I've never paid for. I've always found ways around it with privacy settings on my computer or anything. But Medium, it's articles made more for beginners in a bunch of different fields. And sometimes they're really good, sometimes they're not. But they really are, if you're just getting into it, or for hobbyists, and they do it on every single subject. So even if you're an expert, you can learn something new in your field because it's new news in your field. Or as some part of your field you haven't explored that much. But just also still more of a beginner's type. SciSo is completely free on YouTube. Um, it's by Hank Green and a couple other ones. There's a couple people presented, but I think it was started by Hank Green. He's definitely the main person. SciSo, really really short and just every week or every, I think even maybe every day, they come up with new shows about the science in general and sometimes weekly updates about new science topics and really well explained and simple and very well fact-checked and accurate. Kind of jokingly, I put next Wikipedia. Wikipedia is great if you really want, the more advanced thing you put on Wikipedia, the more accurate it seems. So if you really want to go in advance, in-depth thing, just go to Wikipedia to get the background. Of course, they give you a lot of good numbers for physical constants. If you're trying to design something or build something, I mean, surprisingly accurate. Uh, I know a bunch of scientists that use it, and sometimes it's more up-to-date than like official handbooks because people keep correcting it. But the more pop article you get, the less accurate it is, the more popular, because that's when people start fooling around like Justin Bieber articles. And you do have to check the sources, and I don't mean as a main source. And I kind of put it on soap, but I really do recommend Wikipedia stuff if you're really interested in it. Wikipedia is still not meant, doesn't have the same quality of writing. It's a lot fancier written. Oftentimes it lacks as much explanation. So you might have to open up a Wikipedia article 
and have a couple tabs open up for explanations of what terms it's saying in a Wikipedia article. The next ones are, there's a whole group of like file videos I call, like file P-H-I-L-E on YouTube. Number file, computer file, there's a couple other ones, and there's a couple of layer ones. They're all, if you like math, but you don't, but you want to learn cool math or see cool math, but you're also not a mathematician or expert, if you just have like high school level math, the number file would be a great place to start. Computer file, it's accessible for almost anyone with almost no computer knowledge, but you can go into really advanced subjects. They come up with many videos and they have many old videos that are always cool. You almost never likely run out of videos. There's a bunch of other similar channels and they're all on YouTube completely free. And the format is, there's a guy that interviews real scientists and experts in the field and they make a short video with paper usually and they draw out what they're, what they're thinking or whiteboard. Like a lecture, but a lecture into what those people really are interested in. It's not just any lecture. And they're anywhere from four to 20 minutes and they have um, usually a longer version if you want to go more in depth and we really get technical. The next one I is a big group of channel that I'm going to just call building channels. So what I mean, there's Tom Staten, Peter Stripple, there's Intixa, um, Tom Stan and Peter Stipple do like airplane stuff. Then there's Integiza, which I don't know how you say his name. I N T E G Z A. He does. He does um, three D printing stuff. There's one guy by the MythBusters guy that I haven't watched that much, but these channels they build stuff and test them out. Any of these channels are usually really, as long as they're not talking about history, because when there's history, they kind of go off tangents or they use more technology and they're real iffy. But when they're building stuff about science, you can learn a lot of engineering from them and they're usually experts in the field or people experimenting around and learning on their own and showing you how it, so even if they're not experts, they're learning it as they go and, and building it. And you can learn so much also by watching a person build and it's also how they think and not only the raw data, but also the mindset that these people have. So look up any channel where they build a bunch of stuff or make a bunch of stuff if you want to learn science. Really useful. And sometimes you can do it at home. Some of these are too dangerous to do at home and don't do it. And you also be impressed what you can build at home from metal foundries and stuff, which I don't recommend you build at home or, with, or a fully flying airplane, which I don't recommend you build at home with a lot of precautions unless you take a ton of precautions. For a scientist um, slash mathematician, um, physicist mathematician, I would say mostly, I recommend Roger Penrose, specifically his book, An Emperor's New Mind. Emperor's New Mind is a thick, heavy-duty book. It's like over 400 pages. It's the biggest book of all of these. Roger Penrose also appears in a couple podcasts, but mostly his book. He was a contemporary of Stephen Hawking in many ways. I believe he's still alive. He um, won a Nobel Prize for his work in black holes and solved a lot of the problems of black holes from a theoretical math basis that led to a lot of other people like Stephen Hawking and stuff like that work. He discovered Penrose tiling, which is a cool thing with um, people thought was useless at first, and I'll get back to it, where you can take tiles and if you put the no. The tiles, you can do something called tessellation where you put the tiles in a repeating pattern and you choose like five or ten different types of tiles, even just one, and there's no holes in it. Holes like gaps. So like a square is the easiest to imagine. You just need square, one square, and you can just keep repeating it. But you can do it with hexagons or something. He discovered one, there's no translational symmetry. So if you move it over, like from left to right or right to left, up and down or any way, it's never going to look the same. It's rotationally symmetric, so you can rotate it a certain amount and it looks the same. And this just blew people's minds. Then he discovered it with only a two and later just one tile how to do it. And 
he just kept figuring out new ways with this and just blew people's minds. And people first thought it was useless. But then in nature, we've discovered crystals by mistake with this pattern. And these crystals have really cool properties that we don't fully understand yet. We really don't understand these crystals too much yet, but he started giving a demo mathematical explanation of it. He also discovered stuff in computing, first as pure math, and then later we discovered that he was just working black holes, first pure math, but then he discovered applied to black holes, and he discovered that. So he starts off with like pure math. He's also worked in string theory and a bunch of other things, and his math is always starts as abstract, but then people figure out the uses of it. His theories of black hole, so he proved that you don't have to collapse symmetrically, so you don't have to collapse evenly. Some plus star can collapse faster than other ones, and it can still lead to a black hole. Before everyone thought it had to be symmetric collapse. So he proved that black holes could exist in nature. And that's why he deserved a Nobel Prize. But in his book, The Emperor's New Mind, really great book, but what it does is he goes over science and explains that how it connects to society in different ways. And um, oh yeah, his pen was tiling, the later also found in Muslim temples. And we still don't know how these sorry, mosques, how these mosques have it and where they originally came from. Maybe it's just Western ignorance, but cool fact. But yeah, off back to focus. His book, Emperor's New Mind, talks about mostly computers, but other parts of science and how his ideas, how it intersects with philosophy, how, we, how computers mean we can't make the perfect society, but how we can get better and better. How we soon talk about everything perfection and the limits of our mind and abilities based on science. But he also explains lots of great science and Turing machines and come theories in math and so things with beautiful diagrams and pictures. And he was really a person to look at the pictures. You have to look at the pictures and books and diagrams he makes. And he was always known as a very visual thinker. If you want to learn data science, Towards Data Science Online has a lot of bunch of online data science articles and it's articles on AI and computers that are just great for beginners or experts alike. So that's my recommendation on science. For progressive people to follow, I would recommend, first of all, Philosophy Tube by Ollie. It's, he his early videos are more just pure philosophy and um, sorter. His newer videos take a lot longer to produce, but they're worth it and longer. And they have all these cool costumes and setups and kind of like a storyline to exaggerate it. He's a professional. He's a queer actor, um, professional Shakespearean actor, but he does other roles. And he's excellent at presenting it in dramatic ways, but he covers topics from Ben Shapiro to anti-Semitism. He one of the few non-Jewish people that made an excellent video on anti-Semitism that I can highly recommend. But he abhors and stuff, and he, he covers it from a very philosophy perspective. It is philosophy tube, after all, and really takes usually different post arguments. I like the science approach more, but his approach is, goes hand in hand with mine. And it's much more of a questioning approach and thinking approach. So I don't, my only criticism of him literally is that I just think his approach is only one side of the pro way of tackling the problems in society. But he also gets you thinking. And I think we each need to tackle it from different perspectives and different sides. Um, but sometimes it's one's a little bit in dark, like he had one in suicide. Okay, Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, he's not, does a, people have disagreed with his data, his interpretation of studies. People have disagreed with a lot of things he said to some extent. So, and I really do recommend you read the criticism. Sometimes it sounds like he oversteps his bounds, but he has good ideas. Just don't take them too seriously, is what I would say. It's like, it's like me going up to you saying that um, extra running is good. Well, what I say generally is true, but if you have a broken leg, running is not good. Like, like just like, like 
you should try to be happy. Usually that's true, but maybe being happy is trying to be happy is making you sad. Like it's kind of like that, but he does it with society. He makes good ideas about stuff in society. I just wouldn't see it as the sole thing and know the studies a little bit more interpretation than he says they are, or not as definitive as he makes them out to be. He's a um, black Jewish author, so that's nice to see. Um, Malcolm X Autobiography. So Malcolm Gladwell's books, again. Malcolm X Autobiography, books, audiobooks. He is, um, he really tackles um, law issues in race, but then he starts talking about other issues that progressivism and, cla and classism, ableism, some anti-Semitism and more. And you also see a huge change in him that's remarkable. And he makes excellent points about how you can't, how you need to be strong and how you need to be aggressive, how you can't just bow down to people and keep committing and trying to please your aggressors in every way. But also how you can unite. And you also see a person that goes radical changes throughout his life and what caused them, which is excellent. And he's one of the few people that in his book, admits that he did messed up stuff as a youngster, but then changed and was trying to change. But then you see how he's treated by the US government and other agencies that was so horrible. So it's really eye-opening. It was eye-opening to the struggle for a lot of people and ideas that people can't reform. I cannot recommend his autobiography enough. And it's, he is underappreciated. Um, someone, another person with very strong language is um, Ma Nistana, um, which roughly translates into Hebrew. Why? He's an Orthodox black Jew, um, and he talks a lot about racism, anti-Semitism, the intersection, um, racism within the Jewish community, anti-Semitism within the black community. He talks about sexism, so much more, and he talks about progressivism if you're Jewish. And Jewish values being progressive in the Orthodox community, so it's it's more aimed for Jewish people. But he's out there, and um, I he has a very aggressive tone. What he says is right. A very aggressive tone to really get you thinking and questioning yourself. He has a Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram. He's all very active on. Um, Mani Stana is not his real name; it's his pen name. If you want to learn more about food justice and stuff, I can really recommend the Netflix documentary Rotten. Talks a lot about the awful things that's going on in food and industry throughout and I got a lot of sources information from there. Highly recommend it. It's one of the few documentaries that's actually good and information filled and not just blah 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 or philosophy or just really long exaggerated philosophical quotes they can condensed from like 10 minutes to one minute, which is, by the way, I don't really like TED Talks. They just, like, make it short, make it sweet, put more stuff into it. If you want to find, talk, see someone that's very progressive, now, okay, now I'm getting to more sex and that's is neurodivergence, specifically, but if you want to see someone that covers all different forms of progressivism, um, is disabled, Asian, autistic, uh, non-binary, they, them. This is angry, Asian, autistic. They are wonderful. So much puts in so much of the autistic experience, but also experiences so many, for the disability community, so many other people. They have wonderful writings about their life. Aggressive and angry, but that's needed at times to stress your point. And they also sell wonderful articles and news and information. I cannot recommend they them enough. And I would really read up on what they say. They should be listen they also could use a lot more support, like many autistic people, we get paid almost nothing for advocacy or none of their work. Next one is unmasked up by a Autistic black woman, so-called low functioning, diagnosed. Look, I've gone over it before I might go over it again. 
I'm going to think about functional labels are stupid and absurd. They tell about a wonder, they are one of the best writers about what it's like to be on autistic. We can head of you and write some of the most beautiful writings I've ever seen and make some of the most beautiful points about society that are not complicated. You don't need fancy math or science, but they're just like, why can't we be kind? Or why can't we see this and that? But it's in the most poetic, beautiful ways. Staying something that should be sometimes obvious, but also thinking, but also when it's not obvious, it's like how she thinks in like the most beautiful ways expressed. And the most beautiful little things. Really wonderful writer that needs much more support. The next one is Autism Inclusivity. It's a group run by Stein, Stein's AIM, Autistic Inclusivity Meetings, which is the more bigger organization, but it's a separate Facebook group based on it, led by the founder of AIM, an autistic woman. Um, wonderful group if you want to learn about autism, or just ask the autistic community questions and we will answer you in there and you can read up about it. They also do a lot of just educational work and groundwork, just educating people and stuff like that. Less policies and stuff. Much more just teaching people about their issues and teaching people about who we are and answering parents' questions. If you want to more of a cutesy YouTube life blog thing, I would recommend Princess Aspion on YouTube. Princess Aspion, she's an autistic girl. She is, but it's more about her personal life dealing with meltdowns or tips, like just being autistic and surviving being autism, how she felt treated, but it's also side notes about her life, like how many pets she has, what's her favorite band, much more of the vlog style, and I love it because she is one of the ones with um, ADHD, which more I have, and it's super hyper a lot of times on the channel with the movements of her hands and stuff. It has more of the artistic fashion style that I think is underrepresented and really cool. Another one that's just starting up that I forgot to put here is um, by, and I'll link her YouTube by Kit Arty. And it's also starts, that one is more talking about arti autism and science and her own dealing with nutrient deficits and stuff like that. That one's just very much in the beginning. And it is great. Also, YouTube. If you want, again, Facebook Autism Support Community, it's run by a guy that is quite a bit older than all the other ones, but lived his whole life with autism. And him reflecting back before pre -di when diagnosis popular and having autistic children and grandchildren. And there's a lot about anti-bullying work and stuff. Neuroclast, it's on Facebook, but it's also a blog. It's a bunch of things. And it's a group of autistic writers that write about autism and stuff like that. Really highly recommend it. Um, Hannah Gadsby. She's on YouTube or Netflix mainly. There's other places you can find her. She's just a hilarious comedian. Talks about being a queer woman autistic person. And she is so funny, and she expresses so well what it's like having autism, but not in a bad way, like punching up and just making fun of just being yourself and laughing with her. I cannot recommend her enough, and it's just so well done. So many. Then, I put this a little bit joke, but your local community is one of the best places to get involved with progressive issues or just talking to your neighbor about stuff and learning about problems in your neighborhood, but also your community in who you are. If you're Jewish, take up Jewish issues. If you're black, take up black issues. If you're autistic, take up autistic issues. Because that's the community, that's the place that you can have the most connections to, but it's also going to speak the most to your heart. So when you speak out, it's the most you, and it's the thing you can understand the most because it's part of you. Um, if you want advanced stuff. And from here, I really mean, 
like advanced hardcore articles to read. If you want biology, NCBI, national something, bi biology, bio, biology information or something like that. It's online resources. And it's almost all open or completely open access. High quality, very high quality stuff, but it's highly technical. And it's not always accessible if you're just a beginner. Yeah, highly, highly, highly technical. Again, if you want highly, highly technical, there's Archive X, and now there's also Chem Archive, Archive and Bio Archive, which is just not as good. But Archive X, you can supposedly post anything there, but it's mostly physics and math, tiny bit of chemistry, tiny bit of bio, of quite a bit of computer science stuff. This is when this is where people publish before the peer review article comes out, before, um, not only before the peer review article comes out, before, or if they publish something that's not enough for a full article, or the way they post them technical details that might not be interested in a peer review article, but it's like, please see our technical details here in this thing we published. Like, we made this new computer algorithm, but we didn't want to outline the exact code or parameters because that's too much room for the 100 word article. It's where you publish failed experiments, and technically it's not peer reviewed, so anyone technically publish it, but it's been held to a pretty high standard. And it is like a text system, but the text system, I know, I don't fully know how it, but I know there's a way they can flag like false information. So I highly recommend it, but use a little logic. Also what they publish is mostly computer science, math, and physics that are easier to kind of to check if they're false. Computer science, it's really hard to commit fraud in compared to all the fields. A biology experiment can take decades sometimes to perform, probably more like years. Well, a computer, you can program it in a night and double check if the algorithm works. Not always, sometimes it might take you a couple nights. There are sometimes when you might have super, super, super computer stuff that might take a lot longer to check. But it's a lot more verifiable in general. And it's also something you don't get as much credit or clout as much if you falsify it. I mean, publish a breakthrough in computer science, turns out to be false, you can't be called out. There was actually one guy I remember that did that with phase changes and he posted it and he wouldn't give out the program, refused it. Everyone tried mimic experiment. And it was like supposed to be like a breakthrough and he boasted about like being breakthrough. No one could mimic it and he was fast. He's like, it was a really cool idea that computers could, AI could suddenly switch from learning nothing to learning so much quickly at this boundary point. It's this boundary point you must hit, but no one was able to replicate it. Again, why would you even publish it saying it's an easy model and no one can, because then everyone's going to try and make it. Oh. These are stuff absolutely not to follow or believe unless you're making fun of them. Autism Speaks is a horrible non-autistic led organization and I can, I've gone over, I can go over again. I should make a longer video about them. But Autism Speaks is led by people like the Goldman Sachs CEO, multiple banks, make bankers and financial managers, very, very rich, powerful people. Most of the money goes to paying paying the people working for them, most, for their work. Less than 2% of the money goes to autistic families, then goes to telling them how bad autism is. That's the education they provide. There's no autistic member until like 2000, late 2019, then there's just one supposedly one that some people have questioned and sees as a minor spokesperson. Um, they have promoted conversion therapy for autistic people, really harmful ads, spread rumors, lies, and they're just out there to make money, and they have over $200 million, and they also promoted a lot of really harmful campaigns that's Light Up Blue, which the reason why Light Up Blue is so harmful is, again, the, all the money they take doesn't go to autism, and Light Up Blue campaign confused people because there's a similar campaign before with blue for indicating food allergies. So those people getting confused with food allergies. And food allergies is something that can actually kill people, unlike autism. They also promoted the puzzle piece, which the original puzzle piece was 
a baby crying and it was really detrimental because it had a connotation that were broken and we need to have a piece that's missing that we need to be fixed and stuff. So much more stuff they promoted. Person first language and then saying we identity first and then saying we're autistic. They said we should say person with autism because we're suffering from a horrible disease. They, most, of the, they, most of the research they're funding is all about how to cure autism and not about how to accept us. Such a harmful organization. Such trash. And they use so many fear tactics and they hire directors from movies, from horror movies. Just f please don't support them in any way. Instead, support like autism inclusivity, AIM, ASAN, Autism Self Advocacy Network, ASAN, which is not some place you follow as much, but they do more policy work. AIM does more talking people. This AWN, Autism Women Non Binary Network. There's a bunch of other ones, autistic led. They also talk about the people that are confined to the house because of this and that. And they do include those people, but they include with giving them a voice and letting them speak their own minds. Um, don't watch movies about autism without us. They're always, almost always really messed up. And they also get us totally wrong. We also have faced higher employment. So we need to get employed, so it's also employment. There's a bunch of us that are authors, actors, stuff that would struggle to get employment. And there could be a bunch more of us. Yeah, and they also always mess up in so many ways. It's ridiculous. And they don't show the artistic community. In my experience, it's the artistic community that we really helps other artistic people. We support each other. And they never saw a community. It's always a savior complex that we have the problems, we have all this, everything messed up out, and some normal savior saves us. And the people that help us are not autistic, are usually people that have a minorities that face a ton of discrimination themselves. Totally misleading. They don't explain to you how we think anything, they just, such external crap, they don't show us the diversity in our community. <sighs> um, the next guy here, Richard Dawkins, he's the antithesis of um, Stephen Jay Gould, one of the most intolerant guys. He spread a lot of fake ideas by evolution. He's basically a modern day eugenicist, um, super Islamic phobic, but doesn't know anything about Muslims. He accused them of being drunkards and being drunk all times. But they don't drink. He made fun of Jewish people. He makes fun of religion, but he talks of Jews and Muslims with no understanding of either religion. It's really based on like Catholic Church ideas of what's messed up in the Catholic Church, but still making fun of rulers in general is kind of messed up. Uh, he pretends to be superior, but his ideas have evolution have been proven wrong, such as he believes that all creatures are completely selfless and all genes are completely selfless, and there's no acts of kindness, and people have pointed out like ants honeybees and all these exceptions he says they don't exist he really said honeybees don't exist like this guy is crazy and he is kind of like Ayn Rand Jung genesis pretending to be a scientist and so much of what he said has just been disproven by everyone and he's such a prejudiced people and his family which they forget to mention his mother and father were the head of the armed subjugation his father was the head his mother was um Someone in the business side and the secretarial side of, I believe it was Kenya, it might have been Ethiopia, under British rule. And he is super racist, and you wonder why. And his whole family was the direct armed forces colonizer for the British Empire. Another one is, I do not like Neil deGrasse Tyson. He made some excellent early videos that I grew up on. So I want to say is he's a pretty good presenter. But then you read, read his Twitter feed and his social media, and he's just so mean to people. He would, he made fun of the Parkland shootings, school shootings. He's made fun of people in really desperate times, said really mean stuff. He's a, he's a complete asshole online, and he's always trying to be outsmart and pretend he's smart on everyone. And sometimes you can find, figure out very good counter-arguments to what he says. 
but even when it's not, he just said it in the most assholey way. Um, like he said, people should not be so upset about the park and shooting because more people every year die in car crashes. Like he literally says stuff like that, and it's like, yeah, but the park and shooting was so much more preventable, and so many more people die in a day, day and kids more and stuff like that. Bill Nye, and also he has mobile assault allegations against him, but he was just dropped, and there wasn't really a lot of talk about it. Bill Nye, the science guy, there are some um, allegations against him, but mostly he says nothing. He just repeats himself, repeats himself, repeats himself, um, uses a bunch of plastic colors, stuff because he doesn't have a real skill of playing. He's just eye candy and beautiful colors for people. And then whenever he's on a talk show or something, he just interrupts the people so much, says something, nothing new, and he's so mean to other interviewers. Then now and then he's been spreading false science. Like he had a whole thing about how the mask works. And if it's just totally wrong. Masks do work for COVID, but his explanation is totally wrong. His explanation is because they block air, they block viruses. First he says they don't block air so you can breathe in. Then he says they block air and they block viruses. Then he says he can't blow a candle when he has a mask on. That's totally not how masks work. It's more like a fishnet. Well, um, it doesn't block the air if the air was lick water, but the fish with viruses get caught up in the holes, but it's more complicated than that because this airflow that is turbulent, so it more hits the thing, it doesn't just flow straight through it, bends and twists and it, stuff, and the net is sticky and has like latches on it to that latch on device, and it's statistic, um, um, electrical tracks and bring the virus it's the best i can say is like a it's like the mask is like a sticky maze almost the air flows and bends and curves around in all different ways but it flows out but viruses can go through the sticky maze and just hit the walls and get stuck that's the best simple explanation but i would not follow bill nye well thank you very much for this incredibly long video some recommendations um i hope you enjoyed it please subscribe and watch my other videos it really helps out i'm trying to reach a thousand subscribers within a year hardcore and also if you have any questions feel free to dm me if you have my contacts if not just leave it in the comments below and i will respond to them or any recommendations thank you very much